Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, like it was said before, uh, I've been investigating the paranormal for actually going on 37 years now. I'm 38 years old. <laughs> And we've done so many cases, and of course, living in New England, uh, we originally come from Rhode Island, now we moved to Connecticut, but living in New England, it was almost, I mean, you know, you had to do a book on the legends and ghosts of, of pirates and lost ships, because there's so many of them, I could have actually written uh, three books, but uh, word constraints held us to about one book. And so, I'm going to give you some of the how many people um, know a lot about the legends, ghost ships, pirates, all that of New England? Yeah? <clears throat> you're gonna, you're gonna, this is fun. You're gonna love this. Okay. So anyway, this is some of the ones we'll be going over tonight. Um, some, uh, anyone who knows any of them, these are your favorites. Uh, you know, they, a lot of these um, all happen from all of New England, all the way through, uh, you know, the... Uh, Block Island, what is it? Uh, not Block, Long Island Sound, right up to Maine. So let's get started. <clears throat> One of the earliest things that happened was uh, in 1647 in New Haven. New Haven was um, a colony or an area that was going broke. They had nothing, nobody won. Well, it's New Haven, what do you want? Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so they decided they were going to catch up with the commerce and the trade and really quickly, so they had this ship, the Fellowship, built in Rhode Island and brought to them. Well, um, right away, Captain Lamberton, who, who was hired to uh, actually captain it, he said the thing was unseaworthy. He said it was walty, okay? And everybody was a little bit afraid of it, but they loaded it up with all their grains, their lumber, their furs and everything, and they were gonna head for England. And it was such an occasion that some of the elite of New Haven wanted to go with them. So they said, okay, you know, everyone hop in. Well, there was a few things that made it not so good uh, as far as luck goes for the ship. First of all, it was frozen in the harbor. So they had to cut the ice to get it out. But what they did is they dragged it by its keel out past the ice for good luck. Then they asked uh, Reverend Davenport, um, the famous Jonathan, Reverend Davenport, yes. They said, could you do a prayer for us? And of course, he said, yeah. So he started with this wonderful invocation, which ended, Lord, if it be thy pleasure to bury these, our friends, at the bottom of the sea, take them, they are thine. <laughs> so now everyone's on the boat going, whoa. <laughs> yeah. I, I would have canceled my trip. But anyway, uh, so the boat takes off, and you can see it listing back and forth because it's so walty, and it disappears. Well, a year goes by, and not a word from the ship. All of a sudden, boats are coming in and saying, oh yeah, we've been to England. No, we haven't seen that ship. We haven't seen the fellowship, never saw it. Now everybody's like, okay, wow. So one day, all of a sudden, a tempest suddenly starts to engulf the shores of New Haven. And people run out because they see a ship. And they recognize it as the fellowship. It comes, come into port, but yet it's making no waves as it bore down on the wharf, and it seemed like it was almost floating over the water. Then all of a sudden, the masts start falling, the fire, it consumes the ship, and it just sinks into the deep. Because what they saw was the ghost spectral ship of New Haven. And Reverend Davenport, in his optimism, was standing there, and he said, this was the very mold of our ship, and thus was their tragic end. <laughs> so the, the ship was lost. Ah, the pirate's wife. How many people have been to the Isles of Shoals? Beautiful place, huh? Oh man, we were yeah. We, we did a uh, Star Island this year. It was it was and last year. It was a lot of fun. But anyway, um, Martha Herring. There's a stories about is com um, commonly think that Blackbeard took a 14th wife, he, he did, he had 15 actually, but. Um, Martha Herring actually married Sandy Gordon, Blackbeard's, um, I guess, sidekick. 
And they wedded at the Isles of Shoals. Now the pirates and, um, always went to the Isles of Shoals because they could hide out and the Shoalers loved them because the pirates would give them lots of money and stuff. So, you know, it was a, it was a great companionship. Anyway, they, they, they wedded and they stayed at the Isles of Shoals for a while, but all of a sudden uh, they see a, a British man of war coming. Now, Sandy Gordon was a, a captain of the ship, the Flying Scott. So the British man of war comes and Sandy Gordon said, you stay here, Martha, and guard the treasure. I will be back. And so now they go off, they, the man of war follows them, they get into a battle, and rather than taken alive, Sandy Gordon and his men blow up the ship. They go into the powder magazine, they ignite it. So they never come back, but Herring stayed on the aisles, and often they were seen looking out into the sea saying, he will come back. She died 15 years later on Lungeon Island, uh, that's Lungeon Island, where Blackbeard supposedly buried treasure. So, so after that, people visiting the Isles of Shoals, including one account of a man who actually wrote down a very, very detailed account, said he was staying on Star Island, he rode over to Lunging, and all of a sudden he saw this woman walking along the rocks, but she was making no noise. And she kind of stopped near him, and he heard her say, she will come back, he will come back. And he's like, who? Well, then she walked away. He went to see her again. He actually went back there and for two or three successive days. But then the fourth day, she returned. And she was staring out and said, he will come back. And that's when he realized he was looking at a ghost. She still roams the island, waiting for her love to come back. People still say they have seen the ghost of Martha Herring. And he will come back. There's a lot of stories the Isles of Shoals, so it's a great place. So what was it, Nine Islands, right? Yeah. The Isidore. The Isidore is a great story. Um, how many people know the story of the Isidore? Okay, well, you will know. <laughs> <laughs> the Isidore is going to say a lot of Kennebunk for, for New Orleans with um, a lot of laden with lots of goods. Well, Thomas King was one of the men who was going to sail out, and he received his pay from uh, Leander Force, the captain. But the night before the sailing out, he has this unbelievably prophetic dream. He is on the deck, the docks, I mean, where the Isidore is supposed to sail, and there are seven coffins. Each one has a brass plate. And he says, what are these coffins for? And a voice says, one is for you. <laughs> well... He uh, wasn't going to sail, right? He talks to a crew member, Jack Haley, and Jack Haley said, I had that same kind of dream. So now, on Thanksgiving morning, it comes time to sail. Leander Force takes a head count, and there's no Thomas King. They look for him, look for him, look for him. They cannot find him. He's hiding. Now, he had already been paid, so uh, the captain was very upset, but they had to sail, so they left. They didn't get too far. A terrible, terrible storm came in, blinding snow and high wind. I guess they didn't watch um, Channel 10 News, right? No school, Foster Gloucester. And, um, <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, the, the captain says, we got to turn back. He goes to turn back, but they never made it. What washed ashore was some wreckage and seven bodies, including one, Jack Haley. Thomas King, a few days later, shows up at his home and uh, told about the dream and why he didn't go. However, some people thought him a hero and some thought him a coward. Seven years later, though, a ship is spotted near Avery Point in Boone Island. As they were approaching it, it vanished. This kept happening. Keepers of Boone Island in Nubble Lights see this ghost spark approaching Avery Cove. Every time it gets near the cove, it vanishes. It makes no ripples, no waves, no sound. But they do see one thing, Isidore. And to this day, the ghost ship is still trying to get home. Dungeon Rock. Dungeon Rock is in Lynn Woods. This place is an amazing, amazing thing. We'll descend into the pirate's realm right now. A ship appears on the Saugus River in a, a boat, little rowboat with some people 
go into the woods. And then they find a note on the, do on the foundry door, the Saugus Ironworks, I think it's the oldest business in the United States. And it wants shackles, chains, and everything else. And they promise if they put them in a certain spot, there will be silver there. And so the people do. They're hiding out to see who these people are, but they never saw them. They only saw the silver there when, when uh, the chains were picked up. Thomas Veal was one of them. They start, stayed at a place called Pirate's Glen, which is still there. They got raided. A port, uh, again, another British man of war comes, sees the ship, uh, gives them chase. They hide. Thomas Veal goes into a cave in the middle of Lynn, and there he lives for a while, hiding out, probably with his treasure. Well, in 1658, there was a terrible earthquake, and it seals the cave. Thomas Veal and um, I guess a few other people get trapped in the cave and die. But Hiram Marble of Charlton, Mass, buys the land, and this is during the spiritual, you know, the first spiritualist movement. He buys the land, and, and he starts communicating with Captain Thomas Veal and Harris about um, the, if they dig... They will find the pirate's body in gold. So him and his son start blasting through this rock at about three feet a month, trying to get this gold. What happens is he keeps communicating with the ghost of Thomas Veal, and Thomas Veal will say, take a left, take a right. You're going the other way. Do this, do that. And they're like, what the heck? And it was tedious labor because when they blessed, they'd have to bring all the rocks out and throw them somewhere. And he built a little house next to this hole. And then they started giving tours for 25 cents and, uh, you know, to, to help fund it. And he actually found like an old sword and he threw it like on a piece of rock and said, look, it's a pirate sword. And people would pay 25 cents to see the rusty sword. And uh, anyway, he died in 1868, but his son continued until 1880. By the time they were done, they had tunneled 200 feet into the earth. They actually never found the treasure. But Hiram Marble did get his wish because he wanted to take the money and make a park where people could go and enjoy and walk around and hike. And Lynn State Woods became that park with Dungeon Rock at its center. People do claim to see misty figures among the rock and home foundation. His son is buried under a pink boulder near the entrance of the rock. Hiram Marble is buried in Charlton, Mass. That's the uh, entrance going down into the cave. We have been to the very end of it, all 200 feet in. And it, sometimes it's very tall, and sometimes about this tall. But they spent their whole life blasting <laughs> a 200 foot hole into the earth. Uh, on the whims of a, of a pirate ghost. <laughs> a pirate ghost. The Dash. The Dash was one of the fastest privateer boats in the War of 1812. It was built in 1813. It was a 220-ton topsail schooner, but it was given a letter as a mark and reprisal in 1814. That means that you have, you're what you call a legal pirate. As long as you only attack ships that are enemy ships, not just anything. So um, this is what turned a lot of people into pirates, incidentally. They'd get these, these um, privateer permission, and then they'd be sitting out in the water until they almost starved to death, and any ship comes by, and they're like, let's get it. <laughs> and now they're a pirate. <laughs> anyway, this thing took a total of 15 prizes, or ships, in 1814 alone. That's how fast this ship was. Well, they said, well, we got one. Let's take, let's get greedy. Let's make another one. So they make the Champlain. And of course, the two captains are, oh, my ship's faster than your ship. So they say, oh, yeah, let's try a race. And they start to race. And the dash just takes off like a shot. Except for one thing, there's a storm coming. And the dash just keeps gone going. The Champlain turns around. The 60 man crew and ship disappears without a trace. Never seen again. Except people start saying they see a ghost ship which resembles the dash. Now, there are many reports, but one of the most astounding reports was during World War II. Um, there was a, a, one of the islands uh, out in the Casco Bay called Pumpkin Nub, a man, Homer Grimm. You couldn't even make that up in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> a man named Homer Grimm and takes his, takes his girlfriend out. I don't even want to know what her name is. Uh, takes his girlfriend out to Pumpkin Nub for a picnic, and they're picnicking 
left to sign during World War II, we have American Navy ships and a British uh, warship patrol in that area. Because there are forts out there. We've been to Jewel Island where the fort is. It's really nice. And all of a sudden, they see this unidentified ship. And they start calling on it to identify itself. And it's not identifying itself. But it's approaching. And they're like, okay, we got to do what we got to do. And they start firing on the ship. And their shells are going right through it. And they're hitting Pumpkin Nub where Homer Grimm is witnessing this. <laughs> and taking cover. The shells, they, when they got close enough for a look, they were, the, the Navy, they were astounded because the shells were passing through. When they were close enough for a look, they saw the sideboard dash as it rounded the island. So they were actually firing on a ghost ship. The Charles Haskell came out of, uh, was uh, one of the fishing boats in George's Bank, one of the many that went to George's Bank. It was built in 1869. The boat was wrought with bad luck, and everybody knows about you know how how well superstitious sailors are, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, one of the workmen finishing the set uh, the sails that before it was supposed to go out to sea slips and breaks his neck. The original buyer backs out. He didn't want a cursed boat. So someone else bought it, and they set sail for George's Bank with all the other boats, and there's a ton of boats out there fishing because that's wonderful fishing. Well, a storm rises up, and everybody moors down for safety. The Charles Haskell, though, was afraid because of the wind, it was going to tip. And so what it did is it cut its lines, which forced it to crash into the Andrew Johnson, cutting the Andrew Johnson in half, and 10 crew members went down with the Andrew Johnson. The Charles Haskell went back to port, a little injured, enough to get repaired, and goes back out. Well, that night at midnight, of course, one of the crew members on watch sees all of a sudden some hands come over the railing. 10 men in oilskins come over the railing and start manning nets. And they're standing there, he gets the captain, and they're standing there like frightened to death as these 10 men, totally oblivious to them, are fishing with the nets, invisible nets. Then they just go over the railing and disappear. Well, now they're in George's bank. That's not like, you know, a day trip. <laughs> they're like, the heck with the fish, we're out of here. And so they start heading back. Every single night while they're heading back to Gloucester Port, the men come over the railing and start fishing, and then disappear back over the side. When that boat, I don't even know if it hit port, I think they just, everyone dove out of it and swam the shore. But when it hit Gloucester Port, the men ran from that boat, and never went back on. The, nobody would board the Charles Haskell. It sat in Gloucester Port until it became a derelict, and only then and only then did they get it, anyone was, get it out of there. So that was the ghost ship of the Charles Haskell. Everyone knows about Ocean Born Mary, right? Okay, well, she, was, she wasn't the first one. O, um, Oceanus Hopkins, who a friend of ours, that's his great, 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 great grandfather who was aboard the Mayflower, was actually the first one born at sea um, on the Mayflower. But, Ocean Born Mary was um, one of the first, also see, 100 years later. In 1720, this, the wolf was headed toward Boston Harbor with Irish immigrants who were heading, they were going to head up to New Hampshire, Henniker, the only place in the world called Henniker. But um, the ship, all of a sudden, they see a pirate ship, and it's boarded by a man named Don Pedro. He, uh, they, in their normal fashion, they tie everybody up, they're going to rob the ship and kill everybody, but then he hears a baby was down below crying. He goes down below, and there's Mrs. Fulton sitting there with a baby who had just been born. Now, he's looking at the baby, and he says, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. If you name the baby after my mother, I'll spare everybody on this ship. So she named the baby Mary after his mother. He uh, lets everybody go, and then he comes back with a beautiful green silk brocade, and he says, this is for her wedding dress. And then he leaves. Well, Don Pedro 
later on retires. He was, you know, and probably one of them privateers turned pirate. And Mary grows up and she's like 6'3", she grows to be 6'3", and she gets married. And um, Don, then Don Pedro, in the meantime, is retired. He went to Henneke. Mary's husband dies. They have several children. He says, I'll take care of you. He takes the Mary and the family in. But one night he's killed by uh, somebody looking for his money. They ran him through with a cutlass. Well, the story goes in different turns from here, but here's one of the popular ones. Of course, Mary died uh, in, in 18, oh, look at that, in, in 184. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty old, huh? <laughs> um, she died at the age of 94. <clears throat> and um, the house, the Oceanborn Mary house, which is this supposed to be a guy named, um, as you can see, Louis Roy, he buys it, and uh, he starts saying and telling stories about how he, Oceanborn Mary helped put out a fire in the house. He saw it go out, and she, well, his mother was looking out the window one night when he was, he was trying to fix a bond during a storm, and he, she said, who's that tall woman that was helping you? And people have gone to the house, and they see Oceanborn Mary crossing the road or answering the door or something. So he was... Um, um, living in Oceanborn Mary's house, and he starts charging people to tour it. And then, he'd, and then he'd sell like you a shovel for 25 cents, and you could dig the backyard up looking for the treasure. <laughs> so yeah, see, she died 1814. <laughs> but anyway, she, Oceanborn Mary, <laughs> that's what she was known her whole life. Well, the best part about this is, yeah, Oceanborn Mary did live. Yeah, Oceanborn Mary was aboard a ship that got um, raided by pirates. Yes, Oceanborn Mary did ma get married in her green brocade dress, which pieces of it are uh, on display in Henneke and at the uh, New Hampshire State Historical Society. But Oceanborn Mary never saw that house in her life. <laughs> and um, um, Mr. Gussie Roy, one st uh, story I heard uh, from a close friend who knew him way back when, like uh, her, her father or some relative, you know, one of a friend of a friend thing. Anyway, there was a rocking chair. And he said, this is, was Oceanborn Mary's rocking chair. She would rock in it. And people would take chips of it. Because Sylvan is. And somebody said, aren't you worried about the, the, the people taking chips of that chair? I mean, it's, it's Oceanborn Mary's chair. He goes, ah, as soon as they're done with it, I'll just get another one and put it in its place. <laughs> So Ocean One Mary did live, but <laughs> not in their house. The Princess Augusta, <clears throat> most people know this as the Palatine. The Princess Augusta, now we, we wrote about this in Pirate Ghosts and Phantom Ships, and I got to actually talk to somebody whose relative was on this ship. It made several journeys, actually, bringing these Palatinites over here, and it actually sprung a leak a few times so his last journey, obviously, was <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when it went to ground in Block Island. In 1738, it was headed for Philadelphia. But they had tainted water on board, and over 200 passengers got sick, and some of them died, including the captain. The first mate and the other rest of the men, he assumed captainship. He started rationing off water and food to them at a hefty price. Well, by the time they got near... Block Island, they realized that they were going to get in serious trouble, so they abandoned the ship and left it to the passengers who were all dying of starvation, um, frostbite, and everything else. <laughs> so the ship just goes flying into the, onto the shore. Okay, it wasn't damaged that badly, but uh, it goes flying onto the shore, and what survivors were taken, and 20 more died from exposure. But they said, you know, this ship, no one's, no one's who's going to take it, and what's, what are they going to do with it? We're going to have to get rid of this. That means you Palatinites are stuck here. Well, what they did is they pushed it out and set it afire for safety reasons. And there's one woman, Mary Van Der Leyen, who was supposedly hit on board. She wouldn't come off the ship. And they could hear her screaming as the ship floated out to sea into flames. They made it markers for the palace and graves of people who died. But there was one survivor called Dutch Cattern who lived on the island. And she was very, very angry over the fact that she was stuck on that island and no one ever came to get her. And no one ever, she couldn't get off that island. She was very poor. 
and no one would give a passage. So she cursed the Princess Augusta to eternally burn for leaving her there. And as you know, on the Saturday between Christmas and New, Year, New Year's Eve, people have seen the glowing fire of the Princess Augusta near Montauk Point, and it's called the Palatine Light. Whitty is, of course, poem the Palatine, gave it also fame. The ghosts of some of the people who died from that trip are also said to wander the island. And there's a few places of old lore, uh, near, especially near Dutch Cat Catterin's old house. So that is the Princess Augusta or the Palatine Light. Anyone ever see it? Neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> the Screeching Lady of Marblehead. This is a great story because wait till you see what they call the Screeching, screeching Lady Cove. I mean, I got an exclusive picture of it. Anyway, um, Marblehead, of course, being a fishing community, um, most of the men are out fishing, and at this time they were, so only the home is women and children, and a ship is coming by, a Spanish ship, and all of a sudden it's boarded by pirates. And these pirates, uh, they want to kill every single passenger aboard like pirates do, no witnesses, no crime. So most of them get killed, but there's this one woman, they noticed she had beautiful rings, very expensive jewelry, and they went to get her, and they were going to cut her hands off for the jewelry, and she just jumped overboard and swam for shore. Well, they caught up with her, and they killed her on the beach. But while she's on the beach screaming, she's screaming, Lord, save me, mercy, Jesus, save me. Um, nobody would come out of their house because it was all women and children. You know, and they, I don't think they, they had much to fight pirates off with. And so the next morning, they come out to the beach where she was killed, and they bury her. But... The curse of that was every single year on the anniversary of her death, these people of Marblehead are subject to hearing that. Now, would you like to see Screeching Lady Cove? That is Screeching Lady Cove. There's the barnacle. Uh, <laughs> from there to there, which is, I'd say, from where I'm standing to that wall. <laughs> And it, we didn't take a picture down here because it's all full of garbage. <laughs> no wonder why she shrieks. So we get there, and my friend Arlene and I, and my friend Ron, we wanted to go so badly to find Screeching Lady Cove, and they give us direction. We pull up, and he goes, I am so underwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> I expected giant cliffs where, you know, a woman's voice echoing over the. And that was it Screeching Lady Cove. <laughs> So if you go there, you can stop at the Barnacle, too. <laughs> in the early 1900s, the Isles of Shoals was a common stop for guinea boats, the Italian fishing boats. And um, <clears throat> that was in, many of them, of course, would be there at the time. One night, a drunk fisherman from aboard one of the boats uh, goes onto the island, attacks and kills one of the women. He goes back to the boat, and of course, his uh, you know, crewmates knew he did something wrong because he was full of blood. They say nothing, they just slink away. Well, the husband comes back and he gets blamed for the murder because he always, he was of one of them really loud mouthed, um, quick tempered guys, and, and so obviously he had to do it. So the, the constables want to take him back to shore and process him and arrest him, but a storm comes up and they can't. But what he does, he takes his storm to his advantage, he dives out the window, runs toward the shore, grabs a dory, and takes off. But no one ever sees him again. Then all of a sudden, the guinea boats return. One night, one of the guys down below, all of a sudden starts screaming, and they go down to the, see what happened, and his hands are cut off. Don't know how or why. Another boat docks, and another night, they hear this rowing of oars, can't see it, big fog, and the, um, they hear the screaming, and the guy's nose was cut off. So another guinea boat, <laughs> they're there, docked, and of course a fog rolls in, and they hear these oars, and the guy's eyes are gouged out. 
Every time a guinea boat docked, someone was inflicted with the, some sort of very harsh, brutal injury. Uh, but before and after, they would hear oars in the water rowing away like a dory and rowing toward it. Well, the guinea boats became scarce until they didn't come anymore because nobody wanted to lose their eyes, arms, legs, whatever. And to this day, though, the phantom dory is still seen roaming around the Isles of Shoals. I'm Italian. <laughs> I was hiding in the closet when we took the ferry. <laughs> The Seabird. Uh, this is Newport's own little boat uh, story. Anyway, Isaac Stell, I found out he was, when he built this boat, because I researched really heavily, I think he built it around 1747 because he bought brand new furniture. I have a sales receipt of him buying brand new furniture around that time. So he furnished his house by building and selling this boat that he calls the Seabird or, you know, at least uh, being the merchant owner of it. Well, in 1750, they were all waiting at the dock for the seabird because Jonathan Huxham and his crew were spotted earlier by fishermen entering the Rhode Island waters. So everyone's there, they want to see their, you know, husbands and brothers and whatever, and all of a sudden the ship comes into view, and you all, you all know what this, this, you know, cove looks like, this or uh, whatever, the Rhode Island's now. It's going like this, and it's almost hitting rocks and ledges, but it doesn't hit a single one. And they're like, what are these guys, drunk, or do they drink half the cargo? So it's bolting along, and all of a sudden, it's full sail still, and it shouldn't be. And it's bolting along, and everyone's like, yay, and the boat passes right by them. Oh, whoa, <laughs> bang, right up on the ground. You know, it runs aground, and they're like, what the heck? They all go running to the boat, and they go on it, and when they get on it, all that stare is a cat and a dog. Yeah. Food was still cooking, table was set, the ca captain's night clothes were on the stairs, papers, gold coins strewn about. But nobody saw anyone ever get off the boat. And you see the, the papers, the log even mentions them entering the Narragansett Bay. There was no sign of struggle. No one was ever seen rowing ashore anywhere. The people on the boat just vanished. They were gone. The whole crew disappeared, never seen, never heard from again. But they were seen entering the bay by fishermen, waving to them and everything. Well, someone else purchased and renamed the boat Beach Bird, <laughs> but no one would sail on the ship. In the, during the Revolutionary War, the British captured the wreck in the harbor and converted it into a gunboat. I think they took it maybe to Nova Scotia, and that's the last it was ever heard of. But the Seabird, uh, is one, that's where the trail ends, is one of our cursed ships. <clears throat> um, this is a good one. Uh, 1872, David Morehouse of the Del Gracia spots a medium-sized brigantine under full sail off the coast of Portugal. They move in and they identify the ship as the Mary Celeste. <clears throat> it was captained by Benjamin Briggs. Um, and actually, Moore, Morehouse's ship had left port a week after the Mary Celeste. And they had already done all their deeds and coming back. He knew something was wrong, so they boarded the ship and they found everything intact and untouched except the compass had been destroyed, the chronometer was missing, and the clock was destroyed. The captain's quarters had a small impression on the bed of a child, but everything was wet. The cargo and everything was still intact, but <clears throat> it was wet. The ship's logs so show that they had set sail with 1,700 casks of liquor, uh, seven crew members aboard, including the captain's wife and infant daughter, um, well, everyone was accomplished, well-respected sailors. <clears throat> the ship's log recorded all the normal daily affairs, and um, the last entry was November 25th. Well, they found the Mary Celeste, like that. Whatever happened to the people, nobody knows. They never, ever found any of them. 
They figured, well, maybe they thought the ship was sinking, but it wasn't. It was in perfect shape. And they abandoned the ship, but it wasn't. They were just gone, vanished into thin air. So they took the ship back, and somebody um, in 18, somebody took the ship. Um, it was built in 1861. It was named the Amazon. Its maiden voyage, captained by Robert McClellan, when they were in port, oh, less than a week later, he came down with sudden pneumonia and died. On its second voyage, it collided with a smaller vessel off the coast of Dover. Everyone aboard that smaller vessel died. Let's see. In 1869, it ran aground in Cape Breton. It was sold and renamed the Mary Celeste. In 1885, the Mary Celeste sailed again and wrecked off the coast of Haiti. So this was really a cursed ship. They probably, uh, wow, huh? In 2001, they did discover the wreckage. They brought the artifacts up and everything from the remains of the Mary Celeste. But still, it remains as one of those great mysteries of what happened to everybody to this day. The Charles Morgan, anyone, want, anyone ever been on the Charles Morgan? Yeah, huh? You're on a real, the last whaling ship in the world, wooden whaling ship. Built in 1841, it was retired in 1921. These crews spent up to five years on that ship, whaling. Five years, wow. Ugh. Anyway, and many dangers, you know. Uh, anyway, it's on display at Mystic Seaport. They just came back. They had to bring it. They had to dry dock it for a while and repair it, but they brought it back. But there's ghosts. You can. This is actually a ghost ship. You can go on and wander amok. Maybe you'll see the ghosts. Many people, many people have seen the phantom forms wandering about the forward room where the cauldrons were kept. They've seen them reclining in the ropes, smoking a pipe, because they still have the big rail, uh, coils of ropes on the ship, just like it was back then. You know, they still hear voices in the forecastle of the ship. They hear them. We've gone in there, and uh, it's pretty small. Wow. Uh, we see, we've invested it several times, and nothing ever happened while we were on there, unfortunately. Or maybe fortunately, I don't know. <laughs> but reports still come through of the ghosts of the Charles Morgan. They are still on the ship, and people who actually do the tours, they told us some stories, because they have to be on the ship to, you know, just obviously. They don't necessarily do the tour. But they said, they, yeah, we've, I've been one guy, he goes, I've been in this little booth here, and all of a sudden I hear be talking below, and I'm like, who's below? This place, the ship is closed now. They go down below, and there's nobody there. It was quite interesting. Um, one last thing I want to get to is the Glossa Fisherman's Memorial. This is an amazing thing that they did, and I don't know how, you, how many people have been to that memorial. You see all the names? When we were writing um, Abandoned Villages and Ghost Towns in New England, we went to Dogtown in Gloucester, which is uh, old Cape Ann. It's an old village in the center of Cape Ann. And we were doing it for this book, Pirate Ghosts and Phantom Ships. We stayed at the Crow's Nest. Remember that in the movie, The Perfect Storm? Yeah. Well, what they did when they filmed that movie, they actually used that big shed across the street so they could get the gaffers and everything in there because the, the roof of the Crow's Nest, the ceiling's like this. And we, they stayed and they advertised it as, what did they advertise it as? Um, no, it was uh, rustic? No, something like that. Anyway, it had shag carpeting from the 70s. <laughs> Upstairs. <laughs> but the people were there were really nice. And um, while we were there, we were there like a week. And uh, one guy, we were talking with a few guys, and they said their, their friend's boat had gone out, but it hadn't come back yet. And this was like three, three days or so. On about the fifth day, Guy comes in, because we're, we're hanging about around in the crow's nest, you know, I was like, wow, our matey. And um, so we're hanging around in there, because they had great fish and chips, too, and the beers were cheap. And um, guy comes in with news that they were fishing, and one of the nets pulled something, and the ship boat started to list a little, and what came up was the mast of the ship they were looking for, the other fishing boat. So it was really unfortunate. So as of this, there's more names on that. Yeah, we were like, oh, I, I got goosebumps thinking about how terrible that is. You know, these guys, they're friends and stuff, you know. But that right there is a wonderful memorial to all the ships. 
Um, the Alice Mar is seen over in Gloucester Port. That, that's another ghost ship. Any questions? No. Comments, concerns? <laughs> Who wants to go out on my boat? <laughs> That'd be pretty impossible because I don't have one. That's a real ghost ship. Oh, no, I, we do got a, I got a canoe. Anyway, <laughs> well, um, well, thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> and you can get our books through um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, other small bookstores, or you can go to our website, which is uh, tomdagostino.com. And you can actually email us, and we not only uh, we, we sell it to you, we personalize it, but we sell also free shipping. So we don't charge that shipping cost. So it's just be like, you know, so see, you don't even have to pay taxes. What do you know? And free shipping. And we personalize them, whatever you want us to say. So thank you very much. <laughs>